Good morning, class. So today we're going to be going over Chapter 13, BLS Resuscitation. So BLS stands for Basic Life Support. Uh, as an EMT, you're going to be considered BLS. For paramedics, we're considered ALS, Advanced Life Support. Okay, so shock and resuscitation applies a fundamental knowledge of the causes, pathophysiology, and management of shock, respiratory failure or arrest, cardiac failure or arrest, and post-resuscitation management. Principles of Basic Life Support, or BLS, were introduced in 1960. Specific techniques have been revised every five to six years. Uh, the most recent review was conducted by the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation, or ILCOR. So elements of BLS, non-invasive emergency life-saving care. Use to treat medical conditions including airway obstruction, respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest. Focuses on the ABCs, airway, uh, obstruction, breathing, respiratory arrest, circulation, cardiac arrest, or severe bleeding. Ideally, only seconds should pass between the time you recognize the patient needs BLS and the start of treatment. Permanent brain damage is possible if brain is without oxygen for four to six minutes. So when you get on scene and you, you see a problem, uh, it's important that you correct it as soon as possible, especially when it relates to airway and breathing. Otherwise, serious consequences could could occur. Right. So this is a chart. We've talked about it a few times. So zero to one minute, cardiac irritability. Zero to four minutes, brain damage not likely. When you get in that four to six minute range, brain damage is uh, going to be a little more likely. Six to ten min minutes, brain damage very likely, and more than ten minutes, irreversible brain damage. So that's why it's important to act quick especially on scene of a call when you see a patient deteriorate or is already in critical condition cardiopulmonary resuscitation resuscitation or cpr used to establish circulation artificial ventilation in a patient who's not breathing and it has no pulse so remember what uh not breathing and no pulse is the medical terms for those so apneic it's not breathing. Okay, so CPR steps. Restore circulation, perform chest compressions. So for an adult, we want to do chest compressions at least at least two inches, at least 100 uh, chest compressions a minute to 120. We want to make sure the airway is open. We want to try and restore breathing, provide rescue breathing. So here we do. Here we have a. An example, people doing CPR, we have one person on compressions and the other one focusing on the airway and bagging him through a BVM and we got the oxygen tank. Okay, so BLS differs from advanced life support or ALS or advanced. Life support involves cardiac monitoring, intravenous fluids and medications, advanced airway adjuncts. So for ALS or Paramedics, we can monitor the heart. We carry what's called Life Pack 12, where we could look at the patient's heart and also do things called four leads and 12 leads, pacing, uh, defib, which is what an AED does. We give shocks to the heart. And intravenous fluids and medications, so we could do IVs. We could also give certain medications within our scope of practice uh, depending on what the patient needs and also advanced airway adjuncts as like an endotracheal tube or a king airway. So the system components of CPR, so this is the, the chain right here. So we want to recognize there's an emergency, we want to also activate 911 and start immediate high quality CPR. We want to get good compressions, make sure the airway is going to be open. And once we get the AED, we want to make sure it's turned on. The pads are on the patient and so they could read a rhythm in case it's a viable rhythm and they're able to, to defib the patient. And then basic and advanced EMS and then ALS and post rest care if we, if we are able to resuscitate a patient. Okay, so AHA or American Health Association, excuse me, American Heart Association, chain of survival, recognition, and activi 
activation of the emergency response system, immediate mm-hmm. high quality CPR, rapid defibrillation, basic and advanced emergency medical services, advanced life support and post arrest care. If any one of the if any one of the links in the chain is absent, the patient is more likely to die. So that's why it's important to, to make sure we do all these steps and we do them as quick and fast as possible and efficiently. So assessing the need for BLS. So what's the first thing we do when we get on scene for every call? Always begin serving the scene. Make sure it's safe. We don't go into any scene that's unsafe. Complete primary assessment as soon as possible. Evaluate your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. You want to make sure the patient's airway is open and it's not blocked. You want to check and see if the patient's breathing. You want to make sure that they have a good pulse. Okay, so determine unresponsiveness. Responsive patient does not need CPR. Basic principles of BLS are the same for infants, children, and adults. Although cardiac arrest in adults Usually occurs before respiratory arrest. The reverse is true for infants and children. Normally before uh, an infant or child goes into cardiac arrest, they will have respiratory arrest. So that's why it's important to make sure that we, we check the pulses and make sure that in pediatrics and kids that they have a pulse. And that we could uh, make sure their airways open and start giving them rescue ventilations. So it looks like he's trying to make sure, uh, assess the responsiveness of the patient, determine if we need CPR or not. So automatic external defibrillations or AED, vital link in the chain of survival. Automatic, automated external defibrillator should be applied to cardiac arrest patients as soon as available. If you witness cardiac arrest, begin CPR and apply the AED as soon as possible. So children, apply after first five cycles of CPR. Manual defibrillator preferred for infants one month to one year. If unavailable, use pediatric size pads and dose attenuating system. If neither is available, then use an AED with adult size pads with anterior posterior placement. So what does that mean? Anterior posterior. So one on the front of the chest and one on the back. It's gonna be your anterior posterior placement with children because most likely the pads are going to be too big if you try and put them on their their front okay so special situations pacemakers and implanted defibrillators wet patients transdermal medication patches so pacemakers and implanted defibrillators we want to be careful and we want to kind of sweep for those we want to make sure the patient does not have a pacemaker and If they do, we want to put the pads on the opposite side or not directly over the pacemaker because it may it may break the pacemaker, it may interfere interfere with the operations of the pacemaker if we do get the patient back. And then wet patients, if you pull anybody out, say out of the pool and they're not breathing, and you're doing CPR, we want to make sure you dry the patient before you put the pads on, and then transdermal medication patches. So sometimes patients wear wear patches, nitroglycerin patches, fentanyl patches, things of that nature. We want to make sure those patches are taken off before we apply any any ADs. So position the patient. For CPR to be effective, patient must be supine on firm, flat surface. If we found a patient on the bed, would we start CPR on them? No, because it's too soft. So if you find a person in bed who's unconscious, not breathing, not, has no pulse, we're going to try and bring them down to the ground or we're going to bring them out to an area where we have room to work. we we'll carry out to the living room and we'll move all the furniture out of the way because you're going to have a bunch of people doing two different things at once and everyone's going to need a little bit of room. So it must be enough space for two rescuers to perform CPR. So like I said, we want to make sure that if we don't have enough room to get in and do our our job effectively enough, we got to bring the patient out to a big enough space. Log roll patient on a long backboard. So this is another good one. So anytime 
that it is confirmed CPR in progress or unresponsive uh, with no pulse before you get on scene, it's a good idea to bring a backboard in. So it'll be easier to bring the patient out. And then if the patient does regain a pulse or you do, do decide to transport, you already have them on a backboard. It's a little easier to load and go. Check for breathing and pulse. Quickly check for breathing and a pulse. Where are you gonna check for a pulse in adults? You're gonna check in the carotid. You're gonna visualize the chest for signs of, of breathing. Where are you gonna check in younger kids for a pulse? The brachial. Okay, so provide external chest compressions. Apply rhythmic pressure and relaxation to lower half of sternum. Heart is located to the left of the middle of the chest between sternum and spine. Compressions squeeze heart, acting as a pump to circulate blood. So this is important for you guys to understand. I know you guys have already done CPR. Is to make sure that your compressions are fast enough to push the blood out. And you also have enough what we call as recoil. We want to make sure the chest comes all the way up uh, to allow the, the heart to fill up with blood. Okay, so administer chest compressions. Allow the chest completely recoil between compressions. So this is what I just talked about. We want to make sure the chest completely recoils between each compression. Proper hand positioning is crucial. Injuries can be minimized by proper technique and hand placement. So as you kind of see, the heart is just off to the left a little bit on the left side of the chest. Okay, so yeah, one hand on top of the other and both directly over the sternum. Pushing down as a compression and then as you release your compression, your hand is gonna remain on the sternum. Okay, so you're gonna do, be doing chest compressions at least 100 times a minute to 120 times a minute. So just visualizations. So head tilt chin lift maneuver. When are we gonna use this type of maneuver? We're gonna use it any type of medical or in non-trauma injury and then jaw thrust. We suspect that a patient's had a, had a traumatic event, we're gonna do jaw thrust. Or if we're unsure, we're gonna do jaw thrust. We're gonna err on the side of caution, correct? So opening the airway and providing artificial ventilation. If you determine the patient is adequately breathing and there are no signs of injury to the head, spine, hip, or pelvis, Place the patient in recovery position, maintains clear airway, allows vomitus to drain from mouth. Roll the patient as a unit. So this can be a recovery position. The side you're gonna roll the patient on is you're gonna have the, the arm, the bottom arm sticking out, and then the other arm's gonna come over and be bent, and the hand's gonna go right underneath the mouth. So in case the patient does vomit, or anything does come up, it's gonna go right over here and it's gonna keep the airway clear instead of keeping a patient on their backs where they have a possibility of choking on something. So the combination of lack of oxygen and too much carbon dioxide in the blood is lethal. Provide slow, deliberate ventilations that last one second. So when you're squeezing the bag, when you're doing a, an adult for every three to five seconds, on the third second, it should take you about one second to fully squeeze the bag. You wanna make sure we get good equal chest rise and fall. If patient is not breathing, ventilations can be given by one or two EMS providers. Use a barrier device. Make sure you're protected. PPE, remember? So opening the airway and providing artificial ventilation. So, we want to squeeze the bag over one second. We want to ch make sure we see ch equal chest rise and fall. And then you see his grip when he's holding the BVM, the mask, down. 
For a patient with a stoma, place a BVM or pocket mask directly over the stoma. Artificial ventilation may result in gastric distension. Stomach becomes filled with air. So that's why it's important not to give a patient too many breaths too fast or too forcefully. Have a suction unit available in case patient vomits. So here we do have a picture of a, of a stoma. Okay. And we're going to put the mask right over it. And we go back through there. Now, if the patient has a, a trach, a tube coming out of here, we could actually take this mask off and hook it directly into our BVM. So one rescuer adult CPR, single rescuer gives both chest compressions and artificial ventilations. Okay, so if you're the only person on scene, you're given both chest compressions and you're providing ventilations. Ratio of compressions to ventilations can be 30 to two for one rescuer. For two rescuer, always preferable to one rescuer CPR, less tiring. Rescuer doing compressions can be switched, facilit facilitates effective chest compressions. Switching rescuers during CPR is critical to maintaining high quality compressions, recommended to switch positions every two minutes. So if you have two people on scene, we want to make sure we, we're switching out constantly. It's very easy to get fatigued or tired when we're doing compressions for two minutes straight. And our quality of chest compressions goes down. Devices and techniques to assist circulation. Active chest, active compression, decompression CPR involves compressing the chest and then actively pulling it back up to its neutral position. Impedance threshold device. Val valve device placed between endotracheal tube and BVM. Limits air entering, to, entering lungs during recoil phase between chest compressions. So here's a picture of the device right here. So a mechanical piston device depresses sternum via compressed gas powered or electric powered plunger. So this is actually powered by um, gas and some of them are, are powered by, by O2 tanks as well. So low distributing band CPR or vest CPR, circumferential chest compression device composed of constricting band and backboard. Manual chest compressions remain the standard of care. So depending on where you guys start working or which departments you work for, they might have their own uh, devices for CPR. And it takes a, a lot of the the issues away with getting bad chest compression or not switching enough people out during the time. And this is actually a picture of it. So we got an auto, auto pulse. So this blue part, it's almost like a backboard. It's going to go right underneath the patient. And then this thing, this white thing is going to go right on top of the patient's chest. It actually gives really good compressions, but we want to make sure it's placed correctly. And it frees up another rescuer as well. So it does come in hand. So infant and child CPR, cardiac arrest in infants and children follows respiratory arrest. Airway and breathing are the focus of pediatric BLS. It causes of child respiratory problems, injury, infections, foreign body, submersion, electrocution, poisoning, overdose, SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, Determine unresponsiveness. Gently tap on the shoulder and speak loudly. Check for breathing and a pulse. Assessment can occur simultaneously. Should take no longer than 10 seconds. So remember, you guys are going to be multitasking when you guys get on scene, especially for a serious call. You're going to be ha having to move fast. So all this stuff should take no less than 10 seconds. You're going to determine unresponsiveness, unresponsiveness check for breathing and a pulse. 
So you can have one hand checking for a pulse, the other hand giving a sternal rub. Another, and while you're doing all that, you're looking to see if the patient's chest is breathing or chest is rising. See if they're breathing. So foreign body obstruction in children is common. Place an unresponsive breathing child in the recovery position. The techniques for opening the airway are modified for pediatric patients. Place a wedge under the upper chest and shoulders when supine. Okay, so you guys are going to learn this in anatomy for, for kids. Their head's going to be a little bit bigger than their body. Um, so you're going to have to place something under their upper backs so their airway kind of straightens out. Okay, so provide rescue, rescue breathing. Not breathing, it has a pulse. One breath every three to five seconds. Not breathing, no pulse. Two breaths after every 30 compressions. So CPR is crucial, life-saving procedure. Provides minimal circulation and ventilation until the patient can receive defibrillation, ALS treatment, and definitive care at the ED. If no ALS is available at scene, provide transport per local protocols. Consider re requesting ALS rendezvous and route to the hospital. Try not to interrupt CPR for more than a few seconds. Chest compression fraction, the total percentage of time during a resuscitation attempt in which chest compressions are being formed, should be at least 60%. Okay, so say, say we were doing, uh, we have an unresponsive patient, we've been on scene for 10 minutes. We're going to at least try and do compressions for at least six of those minutes. When not to start CPR, if the scene is not safe, the patient has obvious signs of death. Rigor mortis, stiffening of the body, dependent lividity, or putrefaction or decomp decomposition of body, evidence of non-survivable injury. So dependent lividity. So when a patient dies, their, their blood's gonna pull down to the lowest part of their body. So, say a patient's sitting down, they passed away. All the blood's gonna pool down to their legs, and you're gonna see that. Okay, so it depends on wherever the patient died, and with the position that they're in, the lowest part of their body is gonna have dependent lividity. If the patient and physician have previously agreed on do not resuscitate orders, it can be a complicated issue. Advanced directives expressing patients' wishes may be hard to find when in doubt begin CPR. So every time I come on scene and we have a possible CPR in progress or we're about to start CPR, I ask family, does the patient have a DNR? Do they have any advanced directive orders? Would you like us to start CPR? There's a whole bunch of legal, ethical questions regarding starting CPR and, and DNR care and you have to do what's in the best interest of the patient. Another thing is you could always do is if you're unsure about something or family members are telling you to start CPR and you do have a DNR in hand, um, you could call your base hospital and you could call and talk to a physician. Explain the situation, explain what's going on. And then that way you have something on a recorded line to, to back you up if something goes wrong. So when you're doing CPR, it's a very complicated issue at times. So when to stop CPR, once you begin CPR, continue until stop acronym. As patient starts breathing and has a pulse. So if you're able to get pulses back and patient starts breathing again, obviously you're gonna start CPR. Patient is transferred to another provider of equal or higher level training. So if ALS gets on scene, uh, they'll probably gonna have you come, come with him and help out with chest compressions. Or when you drop them off at the hospital, you're transferring care. Oh, you are out of strength. So this occasionally happens on long CPR calls. Sometimes you could be doing compressions for 30, 40, 40 minutes 
and it's it's a lot of work it takes a lot out of you or if you call the hospital and you advise them the situation and you tell them we've been doing CPR for 30 minutes and you pushed all the drugs you can do and family does not want them transported and the physician agrees to discontinue CPR then you could um, discontinue so out of strength does not just mean tired but physically unable to continue so foreign body airway obstruction in adults airway obstruction may be caused by relaxation of throat muscles vomited or regurgitated stomach contacts blood damaged tissue dentures foreign bodies in adults usually occurs during a meal and children usually occurs during a meal or at play. Patient with mild airway obstruction is able to exchange air, but with signs of respiratory distress. So it's important to leave these patients alone. You wanna obviously monitor them, but if you do a Heimlich maneuver or if you slap them on the back to try and get them to cough it up, you might actually make the situation worse. The, the airway obstruction might go a little further down their throat. It might cause a full airway obstruction. So sudden severe obstruction is usually easy to recognize in responsive patients. In unresponsive patients, suspected airway obstruction if maneuvers to open airway and ventilate are ineffective. Abdominal thrust maneuver or Heimlich is recommended in responsive adults and children older than one year. Huh? So here's a picture of the Heimlich maneuver, and this is a universal sign of I'm choking. So an easy way to know where your, your hands are going to go is feel for the patient's hip bone, or you could touch your own hip bone and just go right above it, and then right at the belly button, or right wherever the top of the hip bone comes around, is where you're gonna hand, your hand placement's going to be. So you're going to go up and in. When you're when you're doing your thrust, so instead of abdominal thrust maneuver, use chest thrust for the following unresponsive patients: women in un advanced stages of pregnancy. So obviously, you don't want to do anything to hurt the baby. Obese patients are going to be a little harder to get your your arms around. So here's a picture of chest thrust. So notice she, she's not coming down here. She doesn't want to hurt the baby. Unresponsive patients. Determine unresponsiveness. Check for breathing and a pulse. Pulse is present and breathing is absent. Attempt ventilation. Two attempts do not produce. Visible chest rise. Perform 30 compressions. Open airway and look in mouth. Attempt to carefully remove any visible object. Do not do any blind finger sweeps because this will be the same thing. You might push the object down a little further. If you can't see it, don't do any blind finger sweeps. So foreign body airway obstruction in infants and children are a common problem. There are signs and symptoms of airway infection. Do not waste time trying to dislodge a foreign body. On a responsive standing or sitting child, perform Heimlich maneuver. On an unresponsive child or in one year, manage in the same manner as an adult. So get down on one knee, stand right behind the patient, and do your jaw thrust, or excuse me, your your abdominal thrust. So your universal sign of choking. Infants do not use abdominal thrusts. Instead, perform back slaps and chest thrusts, or compressions. So these are going to be your, your back thrusts. So you're going to have one hand underneath. You're going to have your forearm supporting the body. And your hand's going to be supporting the head. Because normally younger kids or infants have a hard time supporting their own head. So you're going to give five back thrusts or back slaps. And then you're going to turn the baby over and give him five chest thrusts. Okay, see how he has his hand supporting the body 
and then his hand back here supporting the excuse me the forearm supporting the body and the hand holding the head so this is what it should look like if you ever get a foreign body area obstruction in an infant so an unresponsive infants begin CPR beginning with chest compressions do not check for a pulse before starting compressions open the airway and look in the mouth remove the object if seen and resume chest compressions if no object is seen so remember no blind finger sweeps if you can't see an object resume chest compressions special resuscitation circumstances opioid overdose standard resuscitation measures take priority over naloxone administration so what this means is we want to start CPR before we start giving uh, Narcan administration yes we still want to give the Narcan administration if we know it's an overdose but let's start CPR let's get some blood flow into that heart remember you got about four to six minutes before some serious injury can occur so cardiac arrest and pregnancy priorities are to provide high quality CPR and relieve pressure off the aorta and vena cava so remember this in pregnancy there's gonna be two patients there's gonna be the pregnant mom and the the child inside so even though the mom doesn't look look great there's still a chance that we can save the kid so that's why we continue CPR in pregnancy and pregnant women so grief support for family members and loved ones family members may experience a psychological crisis that turns into a medical crisis so when somebody loses a family member I'm not sure if any of you guys have ever lost a family member or have known anybody but it's it's a high stress situation and it's never easy for anybody to go through that so it's important to be aware of everybody on scene because it could easily turn into another medical for somebody else family members and loved ones will remember this event in detail for the rest of their lives so it's important to be compassionate be understanding and remain professional at all times and keep the family informed throughout the resuscitation process be honest be truthful okay do not make false statements or give them false hope tell them exactly what's going on it's very important and be be straightforward with patients okay do not tell them in generic terms that uh, your your family member passed away or your family members in a better place right now they need to know I know it sounds a little harsh but sometimes people get this false sense of hope when you tell people like that so after resuscitation has stopped helpful measures include take the family to a quiet private place so take them into the next room use clear language and speak in a warm sensitive and caring manner okay exhibit calm reassuring authority let them know that you did everything that you could use the patient's name use eye contact and appropriate touch when necessary So after resuscitation has stopped, helpful measures include expect emotion, be supportive, but do not hover. Ask if a family, if a friend or family member can be called. Ensure that children are not ignored. So I've been on a few full arrests in family members' homes. And before we before we stop everything, we clean all the trash up. We try and clean up any blood that was left over. We put a blanket over the person. We do everything that we can so the family members don't have to go through that incident again or relive that moment. Or if they see blood on the wall, it might bring, bring back bad memories. So always ask the patient, or excuse me, the family members, if there's anything else that you could do and always try and clean up. Always try and remain professional. 
education and training for the EMT. CPR skills can deteriorate over time. Practice often using mannequin-based training. CPR is self-instruction through a video and or com computer-based modules with hands-on practice may be a reasonable alternative to instructor-led courses. So this is why you guys research your CPR skills or your CPR card every two years. And also another reason is uh, AHA always changes uh, little things every about four to six years. CPR is going to be a little, little different. There's going to be little tweaks and changes to it in four years from the last time you guys did your CPR. You are a patient advocate. Remember, if you think something's going to benefit the patient, you could speak up. You could let family members know. You could let paramedics know. You could let the hospital know what you think is important for the patient. Remember, they can't see what you're seeing. And you have to try and explain it to whoever you need to explain it to. So say if you're, you're calling in for a hospital and you're asking them for some advice, you want to paint a picture, you want to let them know what's going on. You must do your part to facilitate the training of lay people in the critical scares, skills of CPR and AED operation. Okay, so review. Brain damage is very likely in a brain that does not receive oxygen for... So remember the chart that we went over, or that you guys saw earlier in the slides. Okay, so D, permanent brain damage is very likely if the brain is without oxygen for six minutes or longer. After 10 minutes without oxygen, irreversible brain damage is likely. So remember about that four to six minute window is gonna be kind of the time where it's gonna start looking like you're gonna get permanent brain damage. Once it goes past about six minutes, brain damage is gonna be very likely. Okay, so you're zero to one minutes, just cardiac irritability, zero to four, brain damage is not likely at this stage. Four to six minutes, brain damage is possible, but not likely, so six to 10 minutes, okay? So remember that four to six minute mark, that's why it's important to start CPR as soon as possible, get that blood flowing. Which of the following sequences of events describes the AHA's chain of survival? Okay, remember it's that five, five chain links. <laughs> so C, the AHA has determined an ideal sequence of events that if taken can prove the chance of successful resuscitation of a patient who has an occurrence of sudden cardiac arrest, early access, early CPR, early defibrillation, early advanced care, and integrated post-arrest care. If any one of the links in the chain is absent, the patient is more likely to die. So remember, we wanna be able to recognize the situation. Call for, call for EMS, call 911. Early CPR, start compressions. Early defibrillation, we wanna make sure as soon as we get that AED, we place it on the patient, we let the, the monitor read the patient's rhythm. And then early advanced care, if we're able to get paramedics on scene, or we're able to get to the hospital a little quick. And integrated post-arrest care, if we are able to bring the patient back. Okay, for CPR to be effective, the patient must be on a firm surface lying in the So CPR, you're, compress uh, you're doing compressions. You're compressing the chest. And the back has to be on a, a firm surface. Okay, so are we gonna be sent somebody up in the Fowler position? No. You're gonna be, is somebody gonna be face down on the ground in the prone position? No. 
supine yes okay recovery you're lying on your side you're not gonna be able to do CPR doing that okay C for CPR to be effective patient must be lying on a firm surface with enough clear space around the patient for two rescuers to perform CPR if the patient is crumpled up or lying face down you will need to reposition him or her the few seconds that you spend repositioning the patient properly will greatly improve the delivery and effectiveness of CPR. So this is why it's important as soon as you get on scene and you, you find somebody who's uh, apneic and not breathing and pulseless, you're able to move the patient to, to an area where everyone could get in, everyone has space. It will help in your CPR. Pulse check should take You guys should all remember this from CPR classes. So at least five seconds, but no more than ten. So D, the pulse check should take at least five seconds, but no more than ten seconds. One second's way too short. And same thing with five seconds. It may not be long enough to detect a pulse. Okay. So at least 10 seconds, that's a little too long. 10 seconds is a long time in this situation. The brain should not be deprived of the oxygen for longer than six minutes. Every second counts. Remember that 60% of the time that you guys are on scene should be doing chest compression. So if you're on there for 10 minutes, on scene for 10 minutes, it should take six minutes of CPR compressions while you're there. So artificial ventilation may result in the stomach becoming filled with air, condition called so vomitus. Not going to be vomitus is a solid, not a gas. An abdominal thrust maneuver. Acute abdomen. It's going to be gastric distension. Your abdomen is distended or extended. If you could remember that way. Okay, so A, artificial ventilation may result in the stomach becoming filled with air, a condition called gastric distension. Gastric distension is likely to occur if you ventilate too fast. If you give too much air, the airway is not open adequately. Therefore, it is important for you to give slow, gentle breaths. Remember, you're squeezing that bag, that BBM, for at least one second. Don't give it too forcefully, and don't give it too rapidly. So, three to five seconds for a child, and five to six for an adult. Okay, the is a circumferential chest compression device composed of a constricting band and backboard. So, we kind of went over a few of these. But that picture that I showed was the, the circumferential chest compression device. Remember it had that backboard and then it had the little white band over it. What was that called? So B, the low distributing band is a circumferential chest compression device composed of a constricting band and backboard. The device is either electronically or pneumatically driven to compress the heart by putting inward pressure on the thorax. As with the mechanical to piston device, use of the device frees the rescuer to complete other tasks. It is lighter and easier to apply than the mechanical piston device. Okay, so which of the following scenarios would warrant an interruption in the CPR procedures? So C, try not to interrupt CPR for more than a few seconds, except when it's absolutely necessary. For example, if you have to move a patient up or downstairs, you should continue CPR until you arrive at the head or, or foot of the stairs. Interrupt CPR at, the, at an agreed on signal and move quickly to the next level where you can resume CPR. So normally the only time that you are going to stop CPR is when you're moving a patient because it's 
it's pretty hard to do CPR while you're moving a patient. It's just easier and quicker just to move the patient, get them on the gurney or wherever you're moving the patient to, and then resume com chest compressions when you get there. Okay, so family members should be calmed down and reassured that the patient is in good hands. A hysterical family member does not warrant a break in CPR. So a vehicle honking its horn, anxious to pass by. Your primary focus should be on the patient. Let the on-scene police and or traffic control deal with upset motorists and blocked roadways. That's not an issue you guys should worry about. Your primary focus is going to be trying to save that person's life, doing uh, good chest compressions, giving them adequate ventilations. Okay, so being out of breath while trying to resuscitate a patient. CPR should always be continued until the patient's care is transferred to a physician in a hospital setting. Being out of breath does not mean being physically incapable of performing C more CPR. Once you begin CPR in the field, you must continue until one of the following events occurs. So remember those about four or five points that we went over? when we can stop CPR. <laughs> okay, so the patient stops breathing and has no pulse. So that's why you are gonna do CPR on the field. You're out of gas in the ambulance. Well, you guys call for somebody else. Call for additional resources. You're going to continue CPR. A police officer assumes responsibility for the patient and gives direction to discontinue CPR. A police officer cannot tell you to discontinue CPR. They're not higher medical authority. So it's going to be B. The T in the stop mnemonic stands for patient transfer to another person who's trained in BLS to ALS trained personnel or to another emergency medical responder. So, so you're out of gas. This is not a valid reason to stop CPR. You're out of strength or too tired to continue may be a valid reason. So a police officer telling you to stop CPR. A physician who is present or providing online medical control direction should assume responsibility for the patient and give direction to discontinue CPR. Instead of the abdominal thrust maneuver used for women in advanced stages of pregnancy and patients who are obese. So remember, you're not probably not going to be able to get your hands around an obese patient and probably not a pregnant patient. So what kind of maneuver are you going to use? What does the abdominal thrust maneuver, what is it used for? Okay, so it's going to be A, you perform the abdominal thrust maneuver safely on all adults and children. However, for women in advanced stages of pregnancy and patients who are obese, you should use chest thrust. In infants who have signs and symptoms of an airway infection, you should not waste time trying to dislodge a foreign body. You should intervene only if signs of develop such as weak, ineffective cough, cyanosis, strider, absent air movement or a decreasing level of consciousness. So it's gonna be the same thing with adults. Remember, if a patient has mild airway obstruction, they're still moving good air. You're gonna let them, um, you're gonna monitor them, but you're not gonna to touch them. Only if a patient has a severe airway obstruction so D, with a mild airway obstruction, the patient can, force, can cough forcefully. Although there may be wheezing between coughs, as long as the patient can breathe, cough, or talk, you should not interfere with his or her attempts to expel the foreign body. So remember, you, patient can do all these things. You're just going to monitor. If the patient deteriorates, then that's when you're going to step in. 
As with an adult, encourage the child to continue coughing, administer 100% oxygen with a non-rebreather mask, and provide transport to the emergency department. Okay. So, sudden infant death syndrome is going to be SIDS, death of an infant or young child that remains unexplained after a complete autopsy. Bronchitis, it's just an inflammation of the lung. It is not the direct result of a foreign body lodged in the airway. 